looks good. The new adult dystopian series, Alien Apocalypse, and the Gate Shifter series about a shape-shifting alien and a tough, tough girl uh, PI from Seattle. She also writes nonfiction essays, articles, as well as some erotica. <laughs> Saying that. I don't know what that means. Where's the dictionary? Uh, her uh, short, short works have been featured in anthologies, online literary, art and fiction magazines, as well as print venues such as New York Press, Newspaper, and Holistic Health magazines. JC travels extensively and has lived in Europe, Australia, and Asia, but currently lives and works full-time as a writer in Portland, Oregon. To learn more about JC and her writing, please visit her website. And she's going to tell you all about that. Hey, Come on up. than it is fantasy, but technically it's probably urban fantasy, so 
Yeah, it's kind of a mouthful when you're trying to tell people what it's about. So um, <laughs> I was going to read actually from a prequel, which is about the main character in the story, who's um, the male main character, um, Allie's partner and kind of partner in crime and anti-hero and sometimes enemy, um, before he meets her. And this is actually when he meets her mom, when he's working as a kind of a bad guy in Saigon. Um, so he's kind of one of those characters that kind of hops the fence back and forth between being a good guy and a bad guy. And this is when he's sort of a bad guy. So. Um, she goes to hunt him down. Her mom is actually prescient, so um, she knows what's sort of coming, and she knows that he needs to kind of hop the fence, so she went looking for him. So, um, so I was going to read from that, and then if I had time, I was going to maybe read a little bit from the new book that I have coming out in that same series, um, which is like way in the future after, because it's I'm I'm eight main books in now, I'm like 32 episodes, so um, so yeah, it's a long series too. So, okay, so this is just chapter one. She watched him, her eyes riveted on the way he moved, the confident, almost heavy gait that still managed to be strangely feline as he, made, as he walked at the back end of the auditorium. A faint sheen of sweat covered his face and neck, as it did pretty much everyone else in the room, herself included, despite how hard the fans worked in grating circular motions over their heads. Polly had been looking for him for months, years. It was strange to be finally faced with him, and somewhat disconcerting. She was one of the few people who knew who he truly was underneath that expressionless mask. He seemed young to her still, despite what his life had encompassed already. He was young from Polly's perspective, although she knew he might not feel it, nor would he appreciate her pointing out that fact to his face. Like most male seers, he was likely sensitive about his age. They all were, it seemed, when it came to the opposite sex. Male seers never seemed to get their stride with their sexual confidence until they hit the two or three hundred mark at least. And Kali doubted, somehow, that he would be any different, despite who he was. Kali used her sight to memorize every line of him, every structure and taste of his life, in the event he managed to lose her again before she got up the nerve to approach him, and before she determined a way to do so without merely attempting to, him merely attempting to kill her for her troubles. At roughly 80 years old, he had reached most of his adult height, tall, even for a seer, like his father, perhaps 6'5 six, six, or 6'6, six, six, utilizing human measurements. Despite her perception of his life, he looked old for his age, she noticed, physically that is. Perhaps it had been the, the content of those 80 odd years, but his face had a harder cast than most years who had lived so long, she thought. To the humans, he would look perhaps 30, not older than 35, not younger than 27 or 28. His black hair hung down in a ragged line, partly in his eyes now. Those same eyes shone in the dingy overhead lights, an indiscriminate pale that was almost completely colorless as he continued to case the room. The long hair fit the style of the current human fashion, of course, although he was clean-shaven, unlike many male humans in, the rough, in his rough age bracket. Since he was blending with and passing as human, however, it didn't surprise her that he chose to let his hair grow out. Even so, she couldn't help noticing that, on him at least, the longer hair still managed to make him look more warlike than the scraggly, softer look of the human hippie contingent. Part of that might have been the lack of facial hair and the hard, almost sharp planes in his face without anything to soften those lines, but Polly suspected that wasn't all of it. In the same way, the longer hair somehow made him appear more sear than not. Perhaps it simply contrasted too sharp and strongly with those same angular lines in his narrow face. He wasn't a handsome man, really. His features fit together too inharmoniously for that. His large eyes stared, lamplight from that tan skin above the high cheekbones and a not small nose. His narrow mouth formed a, a firm line above an even more firm and distinct jaw. He was attracted, though, in his way. The strange silver lights Collie could see obscuring and darkening his LMA took away from that attractiveness for her, but she knew the intensity of those same lights would undoubtedly have the opposite effect on others. Even now, she saw the eyes of human females noticing them. A European reporter did a double take on his face, and then, then his lean, broad-shouldered body, measuring him with an openly appraising stare. Without seeming to know she'd done it, she wet her lips as she continued to look at him, her pupils dilating slightly as she once more flickered her gaze over him, and his worn jeans and leather belt. The thin black t-shirt he wore stuck to the lean muscles of his chest with sweat, making a dark mark from his neckline to about his sternum. He wore a jacket, too, despite the suffocating heat, a thin leather sheath which told Callie he had at least one gun strapped to his side, if not more than one. For his part, he barely seemed to notice the reporter, although Callie saw him return the appraisal on a furtive kind of road, staring briefly at the human's bare legs and noting the lack of bra before he went back to taking the measurements of the room. A 
As his mind returned to work, he slid back into the blank work face mask of a trained ill infiltrator, Holly noticed. He disappeared inside that mask and then back into the crowd, too, melting away from her view as he continued his ghost like walk around the perimeter. It unnerved her, even without her knowing precisely why he was there. The year was 1974. Nixon had just resigned as President of the United States in the wake of one of the worst political scandals of the 20th century, at least that didn't result in out-and-out -out war, apart from the wars that already raged in Asia. The war in Vietnam continued, seemingly without end, and now the Soviets were involved too, although the United States had finally diminished their presence on the continent, preferring to throw money at the South Vietnamese Army instead. Standing at a press conference in downtown Saigon, in a basement meeting hall, down the street from the famous Carabelle Hotel, Holly felt old suddenly in a way she hadn't for as long as she, she'd been alive. She'd finally found him, the man who would be her unborn daughter's name. Even with what she knew, Holly found the thought chilling. So that's the beginning of that one. basically a huge cast at this point, um, and you know, multiple history lines and things like that. So it just made sense to break them into episodes, because people tend to like read, to read ebooks in smaller chunks, I notice. So, um, so this is actually the, from the first chunk of the next big book that I just, I'm just i in the process of putting out right now. So it's actually episode 32, but the whole book is called Prophet, and will be out in October. So, um, and this is just kind of a middle segment. They're actually just got to Macau, so. Um, and this is a sort of a post-apocalyptic period now. There's actually been kind of a pandemic that's wiped out most of the earth, and there's sort of these little fiefdoms that have kind of cropped up around the world, so this is them kind of still trying to, it's a long story, but <laughs> basically they're, they're there to try to rescue a group of seers that are they believe are gonna help them rebuild a, a better community. Um, so of course I knew there was still a good chance, oh, and this is Allie, by the way, who's speaking. So she's the only first person narrator in most of the series. Of course I knew there was still a good chance our cover would get blown. That would be true no matter whether they acknowledged us publicly or not. Our faces have been plastered all over the feeds for months now, years really, and that didn't even include our fan clubs and whatever else. Because we were terrorists, offici terrorists officially, and had been even before the whole mess with C-277, the feed stations could bypass the ban on real-time imagery and show our real faces. So yeah, we would look familiar to a lot of people, presumably. Rebek seemed to think it unlikely that anyone would be looking for us in a place like this, but yeah, all it would take is one gushing fan or one paranoid conspiracy theory type, and our cover was blown. Even as I thought it, the female guard, who appeared to be in charge, made another apologetic gesture, still watching my face warily, as if trying to gauge my mood. I just looked at her, puzzled, until she indicated with another set of hand gestures that I was to hold out my arm. Unthinkingly, I obeyed. Once I stretched out my hand and arm, she carefully snapped a green-tinted metal bracelet on my left wrist. The ends immediately grew into one another. So yeah, clearly organic. It did something weird to my light, too, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly what. I could still feel revit. I could feel the construct, too, so it hadn't blinded me. I could even feel traces of our mobile construct, although that had been faint all along, and I couldn't be sure anyone on our team would feel much of anything from us at this juncture. I retracted my arm to look at the organic band, frowning slightly, still trying to figure it out. The bracelet shimmered like a living thing in the golden mood lights of the recessed corridor. I glanced at Revit then, right as they were snapping an identical bracelet on his wrist. Then all four guards backed away, bowing to us. I smiled at the four of them, returning the bow subtly, even as I fought a sudden attack of nerves. I was just straightening to my full height when one of the suited figures from the other end of the corridor walked up and pressed a button to summon an elevator for us. He continued to stand there once he'd done it, watching us with no expression on his white face as he waited for the car to descend, his muscular hands clasped together at roughly his waist in front of a tailor-made suit. Despite how expensive the suit looked, the guy still had the professional fighter written all over him, and I could see at least one bulge in his jacket that had to be a gun. The bulk didn't look much like a beer gun either. It occurred to me suddenly that in all of that time, no one had actually spoken to us. Even the humans on the pier relied on hand gestures. They were being polite, Reddick murmured to me. 
Lean closer to my ear, he added in an even lower voice. The humans assume we don't know Mandarin. The seers don't speak to us due to our rank. He smiled at me faintly, kissing my cheek. They can't acknowledge the specific forms of rank for us, so they treat us like higher rank seers within their own hierarchy. He lifted an eyebrow, glancing down at the dress again as he spoke in another low murmur. I thought Reg was teaching you this stuff. I clicked softly but didn't answer. Even so, I could tell the sideways look I gave him brought another shiver of pain. Once the elevator doors opened, the security guy in the suit motioned for us to enter in front of him. I thought he was going to accompany us up, but once we walked inside, he merely hit the correct button for us and walked out. He turned to look at us, his hands clasped as he waited for the doors to close. Our view of him in the corridor disappeared in the next set of seconds, and then the car was moving, traveling up at what felt like a good clip. Exhaling, I turned to Reddit, holding up my braceleted wrist. Locking device, I asked him. He held up a finger, indicating the elevators would be bugged. And they'd have imaging devices in here, too, of course. It didn't take me long to figure out what the bracelet did anyway. As soon as I placed even the faintest whisper of my awareness on the structures I used for telekinesis, I winced at the hard shock that vibrated my leg. When my vision cleared, Rebek smiled at me, quirky an eyebrow. I saw the top look in his eyes and only nodded. We'd expected that, too. Not many people were comfortable having two telekinetic seers lying around the niche list. So yeah, it made sense. Rebek still hated this idea. I could feel it on him. He hated that I was here at all. He just didn't want to say so in here. Anyway, he was trying not to think about it right now, at least not in a way that was going to get him even more wound up. He was up first. He knew that, too. Reaching for him, I clasped his hand. Moving closer to him again, I leaned my body against his, melting into his side. I felt him trying to relax, but mostly failing. I felt him reacting to me in the dress again, too. When the doors finally came to indicate we'd be the opening, I realized neither of us had said a word since I asked him about the walking device. By then, we traveled up 33 floors. When the doors slowly opened, I gazed up and found myself looking at the sky that hung out like a giant bowl of the South China Sea. We were in the same terrace that I had been looking at from the dock. I paused briefly on the, star on the stars, although they looked strangely muted up here. I had been looking at the stars for weeks from the deck of the ship. Revik and I would sit up there some nights and talk, dangling our feet over the sides as we watched the wake of the ship churn below us. Revik had taken up smoking again. Well, I had been gone that half year before everything went down in New York, so it was our compromise to go out there and talk on the, in the air where that fury smell didn't get in all of our clothes and our bed sheets. Clicking my mind back to the present, I followed as Reverend pulled me through forward by the hand, feeling the nerves in his fingers as we walked out onto the carpeted foyer. The elevator doors more or less faced a stone, dark stone wall that was at least half sculpture. It only blocked the portion of the room nearest to the main building on our right, which is how I'd seen the stars in the steaming pool and hot tubs to our left. Now that I stood in front of that dark stone sculpture, however, I couldn't help staring at it, feeling the carding there as some sort of message. A trickling sheen of water ran down the line, sun and flames etched into a marble, blood-red stone. Gold eyes and white teeth stood out sharply from the dark rock, and it struck me that the teeth didn't look like stone at all, that they might have come from a real lion. Staring at that image, I felt the warning in it and hesitated. Revik and I had taken on a lot of people over the past few years, but this is our first stint with organized crime. Even as I thought it, the elevator doors closed silently behind us. Come on, wife, Revik said, his voice and murmur, tick-tock. 